Hey everyone, and welcome to Open Hybrid. I'm Rina Valentin, your host of Cafe Con Leche for the next hour, coming to you from a Chari Executive Suite, inviting you to get social with us online. That is, we just follow us on Instagram at Broxnet TV and like us on Facebook at Open Broxnet Television. And of course, while you're there, don't forget, follow moi on Twitter, FB, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Insta Stories at Rina Valentin. So as we continue to share upcoming events honoring the life, work, and leadership of activist and founder of the United Bronx Parents, Evelina Antonetti, and what would have been Evelina's 100th birthday, the Evelina Centennial Celebration is scheduled to feature concerts, art, exhibitions, music, and much more across the city and Puerto Rico. And today we're going to discuss the Bronx Music Heritage's presentation of Evelina's protest against the film Port Apache, The Bronx, a 1980 crime drama film that follows a police officer as he works in the South Bronx and what is deemed to be the most dangerous location. The film brought about protests from residents for its anti-Latino, Black, and Indigenous settlements. So this program will honor Evelina's contributions to the Fort Apache's protests. And joining us to share more about the film screening and panel is a Bronx Museum Heritage Center's co-artistic director, Elena Martinez, and world-renowned uh, photographer and grandson <laughs> of Evelina Antonetti, Joe Conzo Jr. <laughs> Hi, Rina. You guys, you guys are laughing. It's like, and the segment is over, right? <laughs> Well, I'm trying to inform everybody as best as I possibly can so they, they know what they're, they're getting into. And, and thank you both for taking the time to be here with us. Um, um, as you know, uh, I'm uh, a fan of both of you. Um, so I'm really excited to dive into this uh, topic of, of even why you chose to curate it as such, uh, Elena. So um, I've always been interested in the Fort Apache movie um, for, you know, maybe not all the popular reasons. Um, I remember seeing it as a kid, my family's from that neighborhood. So I remember seeing it as a kid and people were like, oh yeah, I recognize that spot, I recognize that spot. I always knew even from a little kid that it was problematic, probably didn't know why, because I was young. Um, and then, but now working at the Bronx Music Heritage Center, it was also of interest to me that it was literally filmed right out, the, the opening shot of that film is steps away from the front door of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. So it was like right in the neighborhood where we work. So it was like, okay, that's this, um, the Bronx, Fort Apache and some other images from that era, the images of Carter and Reagan walking through Charlotte Street, the fires, Howard Cosell talking about the fire during the Yankee game, um, all kind of contribute to this um, visual that, that kind of still remains for the Bronx for a long time, that we have this reputation because there's all these visuals from that era out that sort of you know give this reputation that I think we're slowly shedding, hopefully, in, in the Bronx. And then the other thing, too, which always really kind of um, freaked me out a little bit when I found this out um, is that so um, Puerto Rico in the Spanish American War, General Miles is the army officer that like goes into Guanica and sort of like takes over the island of Puerto Rico. All but General Miles also fought the Apache out west in, you know, in the in the Indian Wars out west. And so th there's this connection between sort of like the, the settling and the, the displacement of the indigenous communities out west and the takeover of Puerto Rico and this idea of America building empire and colonialism. And then it all kind of ravels together and comes together in this in this Fort Apache, the movie, um, and, and takes place in the Bronx with, um, you know, um, another brown, a brown community and Puerto Rican communities. And so I just feel like all this stuff came together. And, and I would love to talk about these connections and make these connections. And then we always wanted to do this event. The pandemic happened, but then the, the Evelina 100 celebration came in. And, and Evelina's story is so entwined with the with this, with the protest as well, um, you know, taking a lead in the protest of this film. And I think Joe can can speak to that. And so I think it was just the perfect timing to talk about the story of colonialism in indigenous communities, Puerto Rican community, and then also bringing into that was Evelina's legacy too. her work encompassed so much and also working on these issues as well. Wonderful. And I forgot to mention that, you know, Elena Martinez is our folklorist. So everything out of her mouth is the history of everything that's related and unrelated that you may not even know. Um, so there you go. We just got educated. And so then now we have Joe Conzo Jr., who is a world-renowned photographer, but, you know, the New York Times, Harold Dickens, the man who took hip hop's baby pictures. However, we're going to be showing images of him 
I, I don't even know how old you must have been during these protests. I mean, were you born with a camera in your hand? I no, Rena. <laughs> Almost born with a camera in my hand. So I'm known for my hip hop photography, but that's just one hat that I was wearing at the time. And when I wasn't taking pictures of my uh, hip hop brothers and sisters at the time, I'm hanging out with my grandmother during these protests in the Bronx and New York City and all throughout, even as far as Washington, DC. So real quickly, Hollywood came calling to the Bronx. They reached out to my grandmother and said, Dr. Evelina Antonetti, we'd like to use your spaces, your buildings to, for, you know, for this movie. And we need a place for Paul Newman to lay down his head in between all these movie shoots. And she was like, fine, what's in it for us? Oh, we're going to hire 300 people from the community. And we're going to do this and X, Y, and Z. She's like, fantastic jobs for the community. Paul Newman's going to, you know, known as a radical, you know, back then, I mean, a liberal back then. Uh, sure, he can come lay down. He says it in the edit. movie. He even says it in the movie, you know. He says, oh, yeah, yeah you know, they think I'm a liberal. <laughs> so um, she goes, she tells Hollywood, send me the script. And she reads the script. And she's like, ah. And then she starts making phone calls to these ex-young lords, ex-Black Panthers and all these people and passing the script along. And she sends it back to Hollywood, unacceptable. My people are, are, are being demonized and looked down at and they revised the script. They must have sent her six revisions. And she said no. And um, through her connections, she formed a committee called CAFA, C-A-F-A, -A, Committee Against Fort, Fort Apache, which included Luis Torres, uh, Richie Torres, you know, uh, from the Young Lords, and a handful of, you know, uh, community activists. And that was it. We were demonstrating at every film set, every photo shoot, everything that was going on in the city. And to make a long story short, I mean, the producers came and, and met with her and tried to like, you know, smooth her up and butter her up and, you know, even made a stupid comment, like, we're not racist, I eat rice and beans. And she's like, <laughs> and, you know, uh, if you look at the movie today, there's a disclaimer in the beginning of the movie that says this movie does not intend to insult or invade the hardworking men and women of the South Bronx other than, than you know, who they are. And that was a huge, huge win, especially in 1981. Right. When, you know, you don't, very rarely does a community activist group get to go up against Hollywood. Right, right. And it was a huge win for, my grandmother and, and Kafa at the time. Yeah, well, they didn't call her the Hell Lady of the Bronx for no reason. <laughs> it's true. That's true. Oh my gosh, um, this is exciting. Uh, just even hearing it from you know your voice, right? From from you being her grandson and actually capturing some of this, right? Because I mean, you even have an image of Paul Newman. Um, and, and I mean, how old were you then, if you don't mind sharing? So like, I, did you I, even I, know a, what was really going on at that time? So that image of Paul Newman is taken round around the corner from my high school, South Bronx High School, St. Anne's Avenue in Westchester. And I just happened to cut class that day. <laughs> and okay. I walked around with a camera. <laughs> and I saw them filming, you know, the with Paul Newman. And I walked onto the movie set and I'm taking pictures like I'm the set photographer and this, that, and the other until Paul Newman gives me this, you know, who the F are you? and Why are you on my movie set? I get chased off by, uh, you know, a, a staff member. But it was such an iconic shot. It, it, you know, it is, but you never answered my question, Joe. I said, how old were you? Oh, okay. 17. <laughs> 17. Okay, 17. so yes, yeah, so you were you were a teeny bopper over there acting like you're yeah. 
And actually, that's the first picture I ever had published in a publication. The New York Post published that picture, paid me $25. But the best thing about that publication was that it said photo by Joey Dean. Well, congratulations on that. Yeah. And that was the first of many because I, I, I mean, you're archived at, um, at Cornell um, with thousands and thousands of <laughs> Joe Conzo images uh, that actually depict our, our history, our urban history, which is really what I, I'm so proud of uh, the most is that it, it matters, right? No, thank you, thank you. And so before we run out of time, Elena, uh, let's just talk really quickly about the panel structure and what that looks like. So we're gonna start um, in the morning with um, George Stonefish, um, who is a Native American elder, who's gonna give a land acknowledgement and then um, a presentation. Um, and then we're gonna have the first panel with um, Dr. Charles Venator Santiago, who is a um, specialist on the sort of Puerto Rican sovereignty and colonialism, colonialism issues and can talk about how Puerto Rico has, has been sort of trying to get its um, independence from the United States in Congress using similar, um, similar ideas and perspectives that, that Native Americans have been trying to use to get their sovereignty as well. Also on that panel will be Native American writer David Martin and artist Nadima Agard, who put together 15 years ago an exhibit at Olstos on this exact issue, but using all indigenous artists to look at their perspective of Fort Apache, whether it's Fort Apache out west or Fort Apache, the Bronx. And then the second panel will be Joe and Lourdes Torres, who are part of CAFA, to talk about that specifically the, um, the resistance and the, the protests around the film. And then we'll end the day with um, Bobby Sanabria and his band, um, and, um, well, one of the incarnations of his um, ensembles, Albure, to gonna give a tribute to Jerry Gonzalez's um, Fort Apache band. Because um, Jerry Gonzalez was one of the musicians, him and Andy and his brother, they were the musicians that would play at the protests, like they had people that come to the protests and they were part of CAFA to get people to join in and what was going on. And, um, and then in an interview years ago, Jerry Gonzalez said that the reason he named his band the Fort Apache band was to show the world that something good comes from the, the Bronx. It's not wow. just like the movie shows. So I always thought like, if that's, if he said that, I don't know if it's part of the mythology, but that's what he said in this interview. So I was like, okay. So he, he was making a point by naming his band that because him and Andy were not from the Fort Apache neighborhood, but we know is Fort Apache. They're from up North in the Bronx. So by having the band there too, and giving tribute to them, we're also honoring the role that arts play in resistance. And us as the Bronx Music Heritage Center, we know that arts and culture also are part of, um, play have a large part to play. Um, in our communities and in resistance. So um, so we want to include that in there as well. Wonderful. And that's all on September 17th, noon to 3.30 at our Bronx Music Heritage Center space will be the panels. At five o'clock at our outdoor venue, the Bronx Music Hall Plaza will be the concert. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, Joe, you have last words on, on how you're taking in this, this huge celebration of your grandma. Uh, it's it's overwhelming. <laughs> It's, it's overwhelming, you know, to know that she's been gone close to 40 years, you know, and we'll, we'll be celebrating her 100th birthday with a week long of events, you know, from the Bronx Music Heritage Center to Pregones, to Hostos, to even Puerto Rico, and all these different venues and so many people coming together. It's, it's, it's humbling. It's humbling for me as her her oldest grandson, her primel dolor, so to speak. <laughs> uh, but, you know, listen, she she encouraged me in photography. You know, she supported my photography. So I owe her a lot to continue documenting the Bronx and the struggle that we still continue to have today. And it's just amazing how so many people love her. You know, I'm in my own little world. That's my grandmother, my titi. I love her. But to know that thousands of people and her legacies is just un unbreakable is yeah. pretty humbling. It's lovely. It's lovely to see the um, the impact she she's having this year on a, on a broader level. I mean, she deserved it a long time ago, right? It, beyond her physical existence, um, but. The, the, the celebration that's being put together this year is really phenomenal. And so one last thing before we go, because they're wrapping me really hard. What is your favorite Dice that she left you with? We are all born with a PhD and our PhD is in poverty, hunger, and determination. Each and every one of us. 
everybody watching you on this channel, we are born with a PhD. Those are the wise words of Dr. Evelina. And que no hay mal que por bien no venga. Okay, oh, that's, that's, that's a mama. That's <laughs> a abuela thing all over. Oh. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you, Elena Martinez. Joe Caso Jr. once again, uh, the Bronx Music Heritage Centers uh, gonna be having a Fort Apache viewing and panel that's taking place at the Bronx Music Heritage Center, which is located at 1303 Louis 9 Boulevard in the Bronx. That's happening on Saturday, September 17th. It begins at 12, I believe. Is it at 12 that it begins? It goes from 12 to three. And then the Fort Apache concert takes place at seven? Five. five. At five. So that's at five. Uh, and once again, you can always visit evelina100.org for all the events that are taking place in her honor and the specifics on this one that we were just discussing. So uh, we do have to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to talk about the many stylish events happening at this year's Bronx Fashion Week. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 